This is my new meat cubator, and it can grow living flesh. As a test, today we're going to be growing some mouse meat, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start by answering what I assume are your most obvious questions. First, why? Followed by, who on earth would want such a thing? Why is pretty simple. While we've given it an absurd name, the proper name for this is a humidified CO2 incubator, and it's used to grow most types of mammalian cells. Hence, meat cubator. And why I want it is because I've got some mammalian cells that need growing, and this is the only way to do it. This is not the first time we've talked about growing mammalian cells on this channel. A few years ago, you saw me make these meat berries by removing all the plant cells from a grape and replacing them with monkey cells as a way to demonstrate the cutting edge of regenerative medicine. The same technique is being used in hospitals to grow new organs for patients by removing the cells from pig organs and replacing them with patient cells so they have a perfect donor match. Another project that is ongoing is the Neuron Project, where we want to grow human neurons in a special homemade electrode array and connect them up to a computer. Personally, I want to see if we can make them pass some butter, but there's a long way to go before then. What is my purpose? You pass butter. Oh my god. If you saw the stream I did about the Neuron Project, you'll know that I have a new plan that breaks the project up into easier pieces, and building this incubator is step one, and growing fibroblasts to prove that it works is step two. That's the mouse meat I mentioned earlier. From there, it's just a matter of switching out the growth media, and we can try growing some neurons again, and even modifying them to be individually colored and rainbowy. Beyond that, there are so many amazing things you can do with mammalian cells, and now we'll be able to show off some truly cutting-edge genetic engineering, and also make some unspeakable horrors beyond comprehension as well. If you thought the meat berry was weird, wait till you see what we're gonna do with a slice of bread. So today we're going to go over how we built this, how it works, and then give it a test drive with some cells to prove it works. Starting off, we bought a commercially available reptile egg incubator. I love these things, as they're a cheap and effective solution, and I already use one for my bacteria and yeast projects. This way, the heating aspect of the incubator is taken care of, and all we need to do is control the CO2 input. Doing so is really straightforward. To control the flow of CO2 from a normal gas tank, the system first uses an infrared CO2 sensor to detect the level of CO2, and an Arduino is used to read that sensor and then control a solenoid valve to send puffs of CO2 into the incubator. It does this on a cycle and slowly raises the CO2 level to about 5%, which is what's needed for mammalian cells. We also included a little switch on the door that'll turn the CO2 system off if it isn't closed properly, so we're not slowly filling the entire room with CO2. In order to see what the system is doing, we also added a little LCD screen. And finally, there's a little switch to turn this part of the system on or off in case we want to grow cells in media that doesn't require CO2. For those that want to follow along, there's a link in the description to our GitHub where you can find schematics and code for the whole project. We based our design on this tutorial from Andrew Pelling at the University of Ottawa, but had to make a few changes since their code was out of date and we used a few different components. To actually assemble all this, we started by taking the back off the incubator, and we're pleased to find that there's a lot of room in there to fit all the different components. After attaching some long wires to the sensor, we drilled out a hole to the main chamber for it to fit, and then ran wires through to the back. We also drilled a hole for the CO2 inlet tube. Since the incubator is insulated with a lot of spray foam, when we needed to run wires from the front to the back, we could just drill a small hole on one side, then drive a metal rod through the foam to the back. We then locate the rod using a magnet and drilled a second hole for it to come out of. We taped some string to the rod so that after it was pushed all the way through, we had an attachment point for wires so they could be pulled through as well later. We ended up pulling two bundles of wires through. One big one for all the different switches and LCD, and then one set for the door detection switch. To fit the LCD onto the front cover, we popped the front panel cover off and then used a Dremel to mill a slot. We also drilled a hole for the power switch. For the Arduino, and also for the solenoid, we 3D printed a custom box and a custom mount to make it easy to mount them to the back cavity using just a couple screws. With the main electronics mounted and wires run, things could just be plugged in, and the tubing connected. In terms of electronics, we had to make a custom shield to fit on the Arduino with all the different bits and bobs. The schematic, of course, is in the description. Since the point of the incubator is to maintain a specific CO2 concentration, we want to minimize leaks, both so we aren't wasting CO2 and so normal air can't get in. So anything that was in the main chamber of the incubator was sealed in with marine silicone. The only other thing we changed was the color of the light that's built into the incubator by default. Normally it's blue, but we subbed it out for some white LEDs. Since most mammalian media has a color indicator in it so you can see if there's a problem at a glance, it's really important to be able to see that color accurately. But with that, the whole thing can be closed up, and all that's needed was a nice vinyl decal to make it complete. Alright, enough messing around. 
It's mouse meat time. Like pretty much anything you want to grow, mouse cells need food, and that comes in the form of a special culture media. The media we're going to be using is called DMEM, or Dalbico's Modified Eagle Medium, which, as I've said before, disappointingly doesn't contain eagles. But it does contain almost everything else that a growing cell needs. As a quick test of the incubator, just to make sure that everything's working, we loaded some plain DMEM into a six-well plate, and then stuck that in the incubator and let it come up to 5%. Here's what the plate looks like before it goes in, and here it is after it's been in the incubator for a while. The color change is kind of subtle, but it is distinct, and as someone that's done a lot of mammalian culture, you learn to recognize this beautiful red-orange color as the color of happy media. So the incubator is working properly. Now for the real deal. The cells we'll be growing are a primary cell line derived from adult mouse skin, specifically fibroblasts. We chose these because they grow rapidly, are non-human and unlikely to contain any pathogens, and don't require anything that particularly weird or expensive to grow. They're also very easy to genetically modify, so are a great platform for testing various genetic constructs. Also, as cell lines go, they're pretty cheap because of how easy they are to grow and maintain. Something weirder, like, say, hepatocytes from a liver or osteoblasts from bones, often require very expensive media because they need lots of extra growth factors to grow properly. So it drives the price up both because of the initial cell line and the media to grow them. The human cardiac muscle cells that I'm going to be growing in a future video are nearly double the price, just as an example. As a growth medium, plain DMEM isn't actually quite enough, and so there's a few other things we're going to need to add to it for the fibroblast to be happy. First is a supplement called Glutamax. Then we need some pen strep, which is a mix of antibiotics to help make sure the culture stays clean, since pure fibroblasts don't have an immune system to fight off bacteria the way, say, a whole mouse does. Finally, we need some fetal bovine serum, or as I like to call it, baby cow juice, since it contains dozens of growth factors that trick the cell into thinking they're still inside an animal, and so will grow readily. I don't love using this stuff for, I feel like, obvious reasons, so in the future, now that we have this working, we'll be able to explore some less cruel alternatives. But for now, fetal bovine serum is the industry standard, so it's what we're going to use. Before any of these can be used, they need to first be thawed and then warmed to 37 degrees Celsius. So we set up a hot water bath and let everything melt and warm up. While that's warming up, we can prep our workspace. I'll be working in my laminar flow hood today to make sure that everything we do is super sterile, as any contamination will ruin the culture. It blows super clean air over the workspace, so we can work without concern of stuff falling into the various bottles. First, everything gets sprayed down with alcohol, and then I load in some serological pipettes, spraying them down right before I do so. Then I load in a box of flasks, which we'll be using for the culture, again, spraying them down first. You're going to see a bit of a pattern here. Everything is always sprayed down before it's loaded in. With that done and the bottles thawed, I carefully dried the various bottles off with paper towels off camera and then loaded them into the hood. For this witch's brew, I need to add an entire bottle of fetal bovine serum, or about 50 mils worth, then 5 milliliters of Glutamax, and 5 milliliters of pen strep. You'll notice that I am very careful not to touch anything as I do this, especially the inside of the lid. Mammalian culture is like a game of the floor is lava, but everything is lava. Touch nothing unless it is absolutely necessary. Once everything is added, the bottle of media is capped and then brought out of the flow hood and allowed to warm back up before we use it with the cells. Everything else is put away. The cells come as a frozen vial shipped on dry ice. Before I even touch them, I put the pre-warmed DMEM back in the hood. Then I rapidly thaw the cells in the water bath. It's important to thaw them quickly and get them into culture media as fast as possible. I'm using a T75 flask here, so I add 15 milliliters of media to one of them. Then carefully dump the entire vial of cells inside. Then cap it, label it, and quickly bring it over to the incubator. To make sure the media doesn't evaporate, I've placed a bowl of water in the bottom of the incubator to keep the humidity level nice and high, and the temperature is set to 37 degrees to mimic internal body temperature. Then the cells are just left to grow. At first, they look like round cream puffs, and they're just floating around. But over a few hours, they'll sink to the bottom of the dish and attach and then spread out to look more like gooey crystals. Over the course of a few days, the cells will grow and divide and spread through the flask. And at some point, when they cover about 85-90% to 90 of the flask, they've reached what's called confluence, and it's time to split them into new flasks. As a side note, every time I say the word confluence, it just sounds like the sort of thing you say after somebody sneezes. You know, somebody goes like, hachoo, and you go, confluence! When the cells are ready, we first remove the media and discard it. 
I collect the solution by tipping the flask and sucking it up from the bottom corner so as to not disturb the delicate layer of cells stuck to the bottom of the flask. Then we wash the cells with a buffered saline solution called HBSS, swishing it around gently before removing it as well. To get the cells to release from the flask, we add a solution of trypsin, which is an enzyme that will break down the connections the cells have made to the flask, allowing them to float freely again. I like to place the flask on a shaker table to help get everything resuspended. I'll check the cells every minute or two with my inverted microscope, which, unlike a regular microscope, looks up through the bottom of the flask, so that way I can see when the cells have fully detached. When the cells have detached, I add 10 milliliters of fresh media to turn off the trypsin, as it will kill the cells if allowed to keep working. Once that's added, I'll gently mix the flask, then transfer the contents to a 50 mil tube so that I can spin it down in a centrifuge. I spin down the cells gently at low speed to collect them so that I can remove all of the liquid and replace it with fresh media that's free of trypsin. It can be hard to see, but there's a very fine pellet of cells at the bottom of the tube after spinning for a few minutes. The low speed is used so that the cells collect but aren't popped by the high Gs. I'll then carefully remove the liquid without disturbing the pellet and then add 15 milliliters of fresh media. Then, gently resuspend the cells by pipetting up and down a few times. I'll have to add 5 milliliters of this suspension to each of three new flasks, but I started with just one so that I could have a quick look in the microscope to make sure the cells have been suspended properly. With that verified, I added 5 milliliters to each of the other two flasks. Then, all three are topped up with 10 milliliters of fresh media, and the whole stack can be put into the meat incubator to grow. And now the cycle is complete! Once these have grown, I'll do the same process again, but the cells from two of the flasks will be frozen to keep them ready for future use, while one flask I'll keep alive for immediate experiments. A quick final note for those wondering, the way that the CO2 in air mix actually gets into the flask is through the lid. There's a special filter that lets gases exchange while also letting you handle it without it getting contaminated. But that's pretty much it. The meat incubator works, I've got a freezer full of mouse meat, the cells are happy, and we're now ready to embark on a whole new journey of amazing projects. Very shortly, I'm going to be repeating most of what you just saw by using rat neurons and a slightly different growth media to see if we can get neurons to grow properly. My plan is to get really good at growing neurons so that when we next try to grow them on the electrode arrays, we can be sure that at least that aspect of the project isn't an unknown, and we can be sure that if something is going wrong, it's probably on the electronic side. And if we've already got neurons growing, I can show how the brainbow construct works. Or we can modify them to express a calcium-sensitive fluorescent protein and literally see them thinking in the dish without even needing to connect electrodes. But that's all for upcoming videos. If that all sounds exciting and you've enjoyed this first fresh foray into the world of tissue culture, be sure to subscribe because this year is going to be a wild one. And if you'd like to support the show and help us grow new and greater monstrosities, consider becoming a patron of the channel, as cell culture reagents are expensive, and I've got eldritch horrors to feed. Also, patrons and channel members get access to the channel Discord, where I hang out, answer questions, and post sneak peeks of upcoming projects. I know it's been a while since I've posted a video, so I want to say a special thank you to the patrons that stuck around during my absence, but I hope the next year of fun videos will more than make up for it. As I said earlier, links to everything can be found in the description, and I'll see you next time.